you guys. Welcome back to Lily Reads. Okay, so I told you guys September is dedicated to reading books that I usually do not get to. I buy a bunch of them, but I do not get to them. And so in this video, we are going to be taking on memoirs. I love to buy people's memoirs. To me, memoirs are like self-help books. A lot of people like to read self-help books and that's just not me. I am not the self-help girly. I am not someone who tries to dwell too much on improvement because I think that's just something that will come with time and wisdom. I'm not opposed to a self-help book. I just don't reach out for them. But I treat memoirs like self-help books. I like to hear other people's stories and hear what I, and see what I can take away from them. I leave memoirs feeling so encouraged. Here is the thing about a memoir. I always tell people I would be susceptible to joining a cult. And this is why. I love two things. I love good storytelling and I love speeches. Those are my two like favorite things like that other people do that I just suck it in. When someone gives a good speech or if someone is tell, able to tell a good story about triumph and persevering, I absolutely love it. And that's what I love about memoirs. Memoirs, if done well, are able to just tell a story of courage, of pulling through, of going through stuff, the highs, the low, and it just makes me feel so invested in this person. And it makes me feel like me as just simple on me, I can do anything. Cause I see this person just start off as a regular person and turn into something amazing. So I love memoirs. They inspire me in a way that I think self-help books inspire other people, but I love a good memoir. The problem is Something about a memoir feels like a big undertaking because usually you're hearing stories about people's life and something about it just feels like I'm taking on a lot of other people's weight. And the thing is, once I read them, I really enjoy them. So I don't know why I don't pick them up more, but something, whenever I go to pick them up, I'm just like, I got to take on a, somebody else's burdens, take on someone else's, you know, grief and trauma. And it just feels like a lot. But I am going to read for today that have been sitting on my bookshelf. So the first one we are going to read is Will by Will Smith and Mark Manson, with Mark Manson. Um, I have tried to read this book several times. I always get through the first two chapters and something else takes my attention. I really like this cover. Um, I like Will Smith. I like Will Smith well enough. I was on Will Smith's side when it came to slapping Chris Rock. I don't know what to tell you. Um, so I am excited to read this book. This book probably would be more interesting if it came out post him slapping Chris Rock. But you know what? Hopefully Will Smith lives a long and fruitful life and maybe we can get another one. But I am excited to read this because every time I did pick this up, I picked up the audiobook when this came out. Um, and I was enjoying it, but I just kept putting it down. So I am going to try, I'm probably going to do like both audio and physical, depending on what I'm doing. It's a long one. I don't know what the hell Will Smith need all these pages for, but we're going to see. I'm going to give it a fair shot. The next thing that we are going to read is Crying in H Mart. This book has been read and people have enjoyed it and people have loved it. I have not been able to get to it, but I always say, people always ask, how you gonna read all these books, Kenya, one by one? I'm gonna read them one by one. Every book will have its day. And I've owned this book for a while and this is just this day. I will be reading this book this week. It is by Michelle Zahner. I am excited. I feel, I feel like a lot of people read that and they're like, I'd be crying, I'd be this. I always love a good memoir that makes me cry. The next book that we are going to be reading is Viola Davis, Finding Me. This is the book I am most excited to read because Viola Davis is a mother to me. She is a mother to me. I love me some Viola Davis and it's a short one. Viola Davis said, I'm gonna keep it brief. I'm not like Will, I'm gonna keep it brief. So I am excited to get to this. I can't wait to sink my teeth into it. And the last one we are going to read is another one that's been sitting on my shelf for a little bit or one that's been, I've had my eye on for a while. Then I put it on my shelf and it sat there a little bit longer. Somebody's Daughter by Ashley C. Ford. I do not like the cover of this as a memoir. I am a purist when it comes to a memoir. I just kind of think like a memoir should have like a picture on it. It should have something that like, 
has something to do with you. So like this picture, this memoir has like noodles on the cover. So I already am getting a sense of like what this book is trying to do. What sense am I getting from this? I'm asking, I'm asking what, what, what is this giving me? I don't know. I feel like a memoir. I should, I should feel something like if seeing this on my bookshelf, I'm not excited to get into it, you know, but I don't hate it as much as I hate other covers. Oh, it's a snake. It's a snake. I did see that it's a snake, but like, I don't like these little pattern covers. Anyways, we're starting with Will because it's the longest one. And so if I get the longest book out of the way, I usually get through all of them. So let's start with Will. I'll see you guys in the vlog. Peace. I deeply hope you guys do not mind being in my closet. Actually, I am getting this entire closet redone and so I'm trying to film like a clip in here So like when this closet is redone, I remember how it used to look I'm a I like to document things like that. That's a weird thing about me. I like to like have like Moments in my life the befores and the after so like I never film anything in this closet I never take pictures of this closet So I want to have like some moment of my life in this closet before it gets redone It's my birthday gift to myself. I put it off for a really long time I've been living in this house for a couple of years and I kind of always thought this was a project I would do later on living in the house, but I'm like what's stopping me so I am getting this closet redone. So this closet by the end of October will look totally different. But that is not what we are here to discuss. Because what we are here to discuss is Will by Will Smith. So you guys, in this book, we are following Willard Smith. Some people might think his name is William. His name is not William. His name is Willard. Willard Smith. And we start this book off in Philadelphia where Will Smith lives with his father and his mother. His father was in the military until he got his ass kicked out of the military because he shot up the locker room after someone took a thousand dollars from him that he won in a dice game. And his mother is a school teacher. She was on the school board, I think, in Philadelphia. And they all live together. Will Smith is constantly battling, constantly battling with this idea of being a coward because he saw his mom, his dad abuse his mom, and he didn't protect his mother. But he's constantly seen his twin siblings. So not his twin, but he has two siblings that are twins. He's constantly seen them stand up to people, and he has never done that. So if this book would have any type of thesis I think this is book's thesis would be about Will Smith trying to prove to himself that he is someone that can be admired someone who can stand up from himself and someone who can hold his own and in this you follow Will Smith through different periods of his life you get different stages of Will's life so you get um pain you get power I think you get fear you get fantasy, you get performance. Like that's how he kind of breaks up this book and you kind of follow him through his life. So in the intro clip, I was telling you guys how I would be susceptible to joining a cult because I love speeches and I love stories. The reason why I also know I would, I 100% am susceptible to joining a cult or why I know I love the, these things. Another thing that I deeply enjoy that kind of like, goes against like who I kind of am as a person. I love sports stories and I love war movies. You know how everyone gets sick and tired of war movies being made? I do not. I love those things. They all, they hit at something inside of me. I think it's just this idea of people overcoming or coming together and coming up with a plan and defeating something or going, you know, I just love them. And I think what I also love about them is that the beats are predictable. You can predict what's going to happen. They all follow the same thing. You have adversity, then you have coming together and you have community, then you have a rise and then you have something that leads to an epic fall. And then you have once again, triumph at the end. They all hit on this idea of life that I think life is. I think life is about the ebbs and flows. I think life, the real lesson in life is about how you overcome adversity, how you how you deal with the things that are thrown at you. And so all of those things that I love, memoirs, speeches, 
um, sports movies, war movies, all those things hit at this truth that is kind of at the core of my being. And so they really do like affect me. They really do leave this really big effect on me every time I uh, read them. And that's why I'm enjoying Will by Will Smith. I have heard some naysayers about this book. They say that this book, like Will Smith doesn't have a lot of like insightful things to say. And I don't, uh, don't think that they're wrong. Will Smith is not going to drop a gem in your life that you like never heard will smith in this book is constantly using phrases that you've heard he's using motivational words and cues and stuff that you've heard before and so a lot of people be like will what you don't have anything interesting to say but to me he does have something interesting to say because he's will smith and that i think is the real line in this book do you believe the Will Smith hype or do you not? I think if you've never heard of Will Smith or you don't really care about Will Smith, you might not fully appreciate this book because it's like, why should I fucking care? But if you're someone like me who, number one, grew up black and who also like enjoys Will Smith well enough. I enjoy Will Smith well enough. I don't really love most of Will Smith's movies. The Pursuit of Happiness, I think is absolutely amazing. Um... I enjoy King Richard well enough. Um, I didn't enjoy his performance all that much. Um, but like, I enjoy Will Smith well enough. But like, I understand what Will Smith means to culture and what Will Smith has been able to do. And so reading this book, it all hits for me. All the, you know, stupid little like, you know, overly, you know, motivational things that Will's saying hit me like i'm sorry i am the audience for that i am the audience for a motivational speech i am the audience for a motivational but i am the audience for that and memoirs usually hit on that because i'm the audience they work on me they work the gimmick works on me i don't know i'm not too cool for school the gimmicks work on me so all the gimmicks that will is employing in this book they're working on me now my biggest gripe probably if i had to like say something this book is long I have been switching back and forth from audio and physical. So when I'm at home, I'm on physical. Or if I'm doing something around the house or driving, I do this on audio. I can tell you so many things that's happened in this book. And I am literally on chapter eight. I am literally on chapter eight. And I can tell you so many things that have happened in this book. Because I think when doing a memoir, the best way to do a memoir is to follow a specific thread in your life so let's take a memoir most of you have read Jeanette McCurdy I'm glad my mom died now I have my like small little like issues with that book and how it's written more so than her own story just like the prose of it or how it's structured but overall I also love I'm glad my mom died and she's using her mom and the trauma her mom inflicted on her life to tell her story that's the thread the thread is this is what my mom did to me but through that thread we're going into her being on iCarly her doing this her doing the Netflix show we're following that this doesn't necessarily have a thread this feels constantly like Will Smith recounting moments and that's not how for me a memoir should read it shouldn't just read like the will smith show it should read like will smith has a specific thing he wants to talk about and that's why i bring up i guess the thesis would be his thoughts on him being a coward but oftentimes that's kind of dropped it's like like it, every story he tells doesn't have something to do with that but then you could tell like they quickly try to bring it back to that like wait we gotta bring it back we gotta bring it back so I will say like some editing issues I do have with this book is that this book does need that but it doesn't take away the fact that Will Smith has something money cannot buy and in the current state of celebrity it's more obvious than ever Will Smith has charisma the charisma that oozes from this, the pages and the audiobook cannot be bought and sold. Will Smith just has it. There are just some people who I think you drop them in the middle of nowhere and they end up exactly where they are again. Will Smith is one of those. You could put Will Smith in Philadelphia. You could put him in Fort Lauderdale. You can put him in San Francisco. Will Smith always ends up 
being Will Smith. He just does. Like, some people I just think are just so self-actualized at a very young age. Like, they're just, they tap into something that other people don't tap into until a later point in their life or maybe never at all. Y'all know my girl, Beyonce is another one. Beyonce is another person who, like, they were just always going to be who they are. You want to know one? Another person who I think doesn't get credit, who is also this way, Britney Spears. I think when you go watch younger videos of Britney Spears, Britney Spears was always going to be famous. I think you put Britney Spears anywhere. Britney Spears makes it out and she becomes famous. Um, They just have something. When you look at younger videos of them or you hear, like, they just had something. There was this a twinkle in their eye that just other people didn't have. You're just like, whoa you were always going to be something. And Will Smith, I think, personifies that more than anyone, more than any celebrity that there is. Will Smith is one of, is the celebrity of celebrities. He just has it. <laughs> like, this book is just enjoyable. It's enjoyable because Will Smith is enjoyable. I believe Will Smith could walk into this closet right now, and he don't know me from a can of paint, me and Will Smith could have a great conversation because there's just something about him that's just personable. He has charisma. It seems like he can talk to anyone. And I think Will Smith is also aware of that. You guys, Will Smith tells stories. They're interesting. They're interesting. Even the stories you don't expect to be interesting are interesting. Now, there is a bit of like Monday morning quarterbacking going on in this book. Will Smith knows that he is obviously the Will Smith. And Will Smith, I think, has an accountability issue a little bit. Will Smith always, in everything, paints himself as, like, a victim. But also, he's like, but I kind of am the reason why this happened. But, like, because I know I'm the reason why this happens, I'm a victim. Will Smith has a way of victimizing himself a lot in this book. And it's just like, Will, I'm sure things was not as cut and dry as you trying to make things out to be. Will Smith 100% has a persona that he has spent many, many years. That's why him slapping Chris Rock is really, really crazy because there is no one other than a few other celebrities who have done as good a job as Will Smith at cultivating a public persona. Like, he just, he gets it. He gets it. He gets celebrity. He understands celebrity. And this memoir is another way of him understanding celebrity. Now, I really haven't gotten into any juicy juice, any juicy juice. Now, a lot of this stuff, I am not like the number one Will Smith fan. So a lot of this stuff is like news to me when he talks about um, becoming the Fresh Prince and like his rap career. I don't know. I knew no parents just don't understand. Like I know the hits now. I know the hits, but like how everything came to be with him and jazz and all all of that stuff. I don't even I don't even know how he ends up on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And like hearing his story, this is a long ass clip, but stay with me. Hearing his story and how quickly he kind of blows up. He goes from applying to colleges to like being nominated for a Grammy all in within like a 9 month period. Like just in a 9 month period where you need to go to college, son. I'm nominated for the first uh, hip hop Grammy ever like and then he's about to get the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air very very soon like it just things happen so quickly and it really hits on something not to get too woo woo too spiritual but some things are just ordained I don't want to sound like that person but some things are just ordained and Will Smith becoming famous is just something that had to happen like the stars just aligned for him and that's why it all happened so quickly. I don't know. Maybe I'm drinking the juice. I'm drinking the juice. What I say? I could join a cult. <laughs> it don't take much for me to drink somebody's juice. I might be drinking the juice a little bit, but I am enjoying the fuck out of this memoir. So yes, I do think the criticisms, and there's not a lot of people enjoy this memoir well enough, but I do think the criticism of this memoir is valid. There is, number one, some chopping down that needs to be done. Nobody memoir need to be this goddamn law. Like, Will Smith, I get it, but I don't get it. And two, and two, there does need to be something, something bridging these stories together. We need to be hitting on a common theme in all of these stories. And I feel like the theme we're trying to hit on, this idea of cowardliness, and having to stick up for yourself constantly, having to prove yourself constantly. Sometimes it hits, like him talking about because he didn't curse in his raps, P 
people didn't think he was black enough, seeing his mom get abused, all of that. He got knocked out cold in high school. His first day of high school, he got knocked out cold. Well, it wasn't his first. It was his first day at a new high school. He got knocked out cold by this guy. Like, these constant moments of feeling, like, inferior or not feeling like he was black enough or will enough for his circumstance. Though Sometimes they hit, and other times, like, they don't. But this book is also funny as fuck. Will Smith is just funny. He's just funny. And it's even more so, like, <laughs> I when I'm reading the audiobook, sometimes I, like, forget like, sometimes when I read things physically, it's funnier to me physically because I don't know what tone Will Smith is, like, supposed to take in a moment. So it's funnier than probably it would actually be on audio. Because sometimes I'll read something on audio. I'm like, that's not how I thought that was said. So I go back and forth. But it's really good. I think if you're a Will Smith fan or you're just someone who likes memoirs, this is one to pick up. But this clip is long. I will see you guys when I finish it. Okay? Peace. And I, destruction. Downward spiral, happy gun. And in this corner came out Halloween 1989 and achieved full crickets. In a desperate attempt to salvage something from the mess, we sprinted out on the road to perform and promote and do anything we could to inject some life into the album. But it was dead on arrival. The winter of 1989 was a progressively abominable shit show. It began with Ray Rock. He recorded a bunch of songs, none of which ended up making the album. He was one of the best beatboxers there ever was. And in our live shows, he definitely got some of the biggest cheers. But hip hop was changing. Beatboxers were becoming less central to the art form. He felt disrespected and disregarded. As a result, our disagreements became division. Division became open conflict until Ray and I were damn near at war. Play started showing up late for everything. Flights, sound checks, meetings. He'd sleep all day and be in a spank mood all night. Throughout the tour, our arguments escalated in both frequency and intensity. In his mind, he and Jeff were the main attractions, and they were carrying me. Me and Jeff were the only talented ones around here. The rest of y'all just riding our coattails. Play shouted during one of our innumerable collisions. It all came to a head one night in Kansas City. During our show, we would introduce Ray Rock at about the halfway point. He'd come out, and me and him had a 15-minute routine before he'd go off, and me and Jeff would close the show. He had a grand Guys, I need to come and give my final thoughts on Will by Will Smith. I finished this book days ago, and I still have not given you my final thoughts. I enjoyed this book. Here is the thing. I do not believe this is the best written memoir of all time like I think there's some like I don't think everything Will says in this book is genuine Will has a way of like framing everything that's happened in his life as he's kind of a victim or like he tried his best and just fell short but I do think many times Will was just being problematic <laughs> like Will was just not being a good person I do think Will Smith has one of the most carefully curated um carefully curated celebrity personas that has ever been that's why him slapping Chris Rock is so crazy because Will Smith does a lot to make sure that people see him in a certain way and I think this book is no different like there's just places Will Smith isn't willing to go and he kind of like beats around the bush about a lot of topics I think people would like to get answers so I do think that when it comes to a memoir this is a little disingenuous and I also don't think Will Smith has huge reflections about his life. He does have huge re reflections about success, but that pretty much is what Will Smith wants to talk about. Will Smith wants to talk about the success he's had. And that's what this book is. This is 100% just the Will Smith show. Will Smith talking about how great Will Smith has been. I do think the first half of this book is way stronger than the last half. Specifically, the last like 100 pages are really like, Will, we, we losing a plot here a little bit. So I am going to give this book four stars but when it comes to just fucking enjoying it I'm giving it five like Will Smith has so much charisma and I do want to say this before I go I do think a lot of stuff that people cherry picked out of this book was intentional in order to like build a certain narrative people tried to make it seem like will smith was in this book just oversharing and being weird but like he really wasn't like he would say a few things that's just like will we don't need this but it was not just this whole book of will smith just spilling all types of beans and you know, just for the sake of shock value. That's not what this book was. I think most people who have talked about this book have not read this book. I think they just took certain passages and was like, this is what Will Smith is talking about. But in context, Will is not saying anything in this book that's like absolutely absurd. I think people just haven't read this book and are just, you know, being salacious like they do. So I am going to give this book 4.5. Five in my enjoyment for it because I don't think it's a fully well thought out memoir so 4.5 but baby at the end of the year when I say like my most like surprising books this gonna go in it because I did enjoy it so the next thing we are gonna move on to is crying in H Mart okay I will see you guys back for that hello you guys I am here to give first and final thoughts on crying in H Mart 
by Michelle Zauner. Now, I know Michelle is a part of some rock band. I have no clue what that rock band is. I did not know who she was until I read this book. So let's be very clear. I have no uh, cultural context for this woman. So all I have is this memoir. So Crying in H Mart is a memoir written by Michelle about her mother who passed away from cancer. This was a short story that was published in the New Yorker in 2018, I believe. And then from there, it got turned into a novel, a memoir. And that is what this is this book is sitting at I think a 4.28 or 4.25 on Goodreads with over I think 300,000 ratings which means that this book is widely loved people really enjoy this book and so if you want to read a memoir because you know who Michelle is or because you want to read a memoir about grief and someone dealing with the fact that their mother passed away from cancer then I think that you should pick this book up because a lot of people have taken a lot of things from it and a lot of people have really enjoyed it. And I'm a firm believer if a lot of people enjoy things, more than likely you probably will too. And that's why I went into this book very much expecting to really like it. Like I thought this was going to be the memoir for me. I was going to take so many things from it, but that is honestly not my truth. I could come on here and lie and be like, I just love crying in HMR. Like it really just did so much for me, but honestly it didn't. This is a three star memoir for me. Um, I just don't think I'm the audience for this memoir. Um, at, when it first started, I thought it was really good. So we are following Michelle, who is an Asian American. She is half Asian, ha she's half Korean, and she is half white. And when we get, when we meet her, she's in an H Mart and she's talking about how because her Korean mother died, she feels like she's no longer attached to Korean culture because all she has is her white father. And I thought that was just very interesting. That's a very interesting perspective. Being someone who is Asian, but then the only thing left of you is your white side. And then she talks about how she spent so much of her life trying to assimilate to Western culture and trying to fit in with whiteness and being so happy when people would mistake her for a fully white person. Person. And so I thought all of that was so good. But then you get like the middle of the book where we're just following Michelle in different moments of her life. Some moments before her mother died, some moments while her mother was dying, and some moments after. And I kind of felt like they lacked any... um direction you know like I would we would get to like a moment in her life and I'm just like what am I supposed to take from this specific moment and so I found it dull I found a lot of this to be very very dull and I found myself just not being interested in what was going on I never really felt like you know a memoir is supposed to be personal, obviously, but there's also supposed to be something that's really relatable about a memoir. That's what makes for good memoirs when they're able to take something so deep to them and relate it to everyone. And I don't feel like this book is necessarily something... It, I don't think it necessarily consistently hits on a universal truth for me, you know? I felt like Michelle should have wrote this story and needed to write this story. And I feel like it is important to tell the story of the people in your family. And I appreciate it for that. But I don't just think overall it's just a really enticing memoir. I find the narrative structure to be weird. Like I said, we're just bouncing around to certain moments. I don't think all of those moments are good. The best part of this book is when we do circle back to this idea of being a Korean American and this idea of trying to hold on to your heritage without the person who gave you that heritage and how so often we push away the things that make us different from other people and then at some point you want that thing back and maybe is it a little late and what is just innate in you what lives in you what about your culture your heritage your race is just inside of you and it doesn't need someone else to you know bring it out of you I thought that stuff was interesting but throughout that you just get different moments that are just like Okay, and then it doesn't also, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't help that Michelle also lived a perfectly, like, normal life. Like, Michelle has lost, she's loved and she's lost, like, everyone has loved and lost. But Michelle doesn't have some deeply tragic, like, life story. Michelle is someone who grew up 
privileged enough. She is someone who was white presenting to people. She is someone who would go on to find success. She just had some unfortunate things happen, but that's just life. Like you just not gonna hit it out the park in every department. So I do think it's also sometimes hard when you're not dealing directly with her mother. It's hard to have empathy for Michelle in certain places because it's just like, this ain't the worst fucking thing that could have happened to somebody, except for the parts that's like obvious, her mom dying, her aunt dying, you know, stuff like that. But when she's telling stories that aren't as deep as that, it's just regular stories, you just like, so I wouldn't go as far as, so I did say you don't have empathy for it. It's not, I wouldn't go as far as to say you don't have empathy, but you do find yourself like me a little bit, like rolling your eyes, like, okay next thing you know so honestly this didn't really do anything for me which is really really shocking i'm gonna get dragged for filth for saying that because so many people absolutely adore this book i am simply just not one of those people maybe at a different point in my life i would have been a little more into it we'll move on i did find the last three chapters to be really really good though i did we're gonna move on to somebody's daughter by Ashley C. Ford. This is a really, really short memoir. Not even hitting at 300 pages. Barely hitting at 200 pages. So this is a really, really short one. I could probably read this in one sitting. So yeah, Somebody's Daughter is next. I'm sorry, you guys, for all you crying in H Mart fans. I'm sorry. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I did not get it. Oh, another thing. I didn't find the writing to be all that impressive. Um, yeah, just not for me. It's for other people. I can see why other people would like it. But for me, it wasn't all that. But like, obviously, I can't tell her not to write the memoir. She shouldn't like it's about her dead mother. Like she should write the memoir. It just simply wasn't my thing. Okay, peace. Hello, you guys. I am sick as a dog. I am sick as a dog. So I have had nothing but time to lay in the bed and read. I'm constantly putting all types of pills and potions into my nose, down my throat, because I am just trying to feel better. I feel the best I've ever felt this past week, but I sound the worst because that's just how it goes. My body is just trying to get everything out. Look at the glisten. I have on me. It's 72 degrees in my house. It's not hot. I'm my body constantly goes from cold to hot, from cold to hot. So I have just been in the house ordering in food and just reading and watching TV. That has pretty much been my life. But because of that, I have been able to finish Somebody's Daughter. This book is really, really short and really easy to read. So of course, this is a memoir video. So we are reading a memoir by Ashley C. Ford. This is the story of Ashley C. Ford's childhood and everything she dealt with with being sexually assaulted and her father going to jail for sexually assaulting two people and her mother kind of being um her mother being kind of abusive um and like basically her childhood and all of that stuff um I'm sorry I really explained that poorly but that's what this book is about this book has some really interesting things to say about how black girls aren't protected in society and how so quickly you were taught as a black girl to be on the defense, but even though people are telling you to be on the, the defense, no one seems to want to protect you at the same time. Everyone is talking about the harm that can be caused to you, but no one is ever trying to get to the root of that, which is protecting black girls. So you are almost blamed for the violence against you, but also you're expected to stop the violence against you at the same time so you have to constantly like people tell you to dress a certain way so you're the you're the reason why you're being sexually assaulted the way you dress the way you act but at the same time people also want you to stop the behaviors of other people who are doing the harm so it's like neither of these are fixing the problem because no one wants to address the fact that men are violent towards black girls and black boys are violent towards black girls but also no one everyone also is telling you this is how you need to dress this is what you need to do and so it's like but that doesn't stop the issue either because even when i do all those things 
violence is still coming and so no one is actually trying to protect you so this book being called somebody's daughter actually is talking about how she just wants to feel like she's someone's daughter she just wants to feel like someone cares about her and i just think if you grew up as a black girl you know exactly what that means even the people who seem to have your best interest show love to you in a really cruel way that as a child you can't really wrap your head around like why is the cruelty that my parents and the other women showed me like telling me not to wear tight clothes telling me not to wear shorts around boys why is this being seen as love when it seems so cruel no one else is being treated as cruelly as i'm being treated and it doesn't feel like protection so you have ashley who just wants to be protected but it does open up this conversation between ashley and her father i would be curious to talk to ashley or like listen to some interviews about how Ashley deals with the fact that she was sexually assaulted and her father went to jail for sexually assaulting two people and how she deals with that because you see Ashley wanting to have a relationship with her father and her almost looking up to her father because she just wants some type of protection but her father has also been convicted of being sexually violent towards women and that's something that has happened to her so how does she kind of wrap her head around that so because of that i am going to give this book four out of five stars because i do think there could have been a more interesting conversation had about that i'm not judging ashley in any way i'm not saying that she shouldn't be close to her father because no i think the conversation is a lot more complex than that and i think this book is talk is speaking on that when she goes to visit her father in jail she talks about how she just wants some Someone to protect her and she feels like her father can do that but what does that say that your father who allegedly sexually assaulted two women is who you believe can protect you from the other dangers of men it just starts this cycle of misogyny and violence towards women that the only people who can protect us from violent men is other violent men you know but that's all she, like, she's a child. And so that's all she can feel, you know, because it's all she knows. She can't have the answers to life. So I actually appreciate the complexity to that. I appreciate this idea of not having all the answers and not fully thinking in the way maybe you should. Like, it's not easy to just be like, I'm never talking to my daddy again because he did X, Y, and Z because she's her, her entire life has fantasized about having some type of relationship with her father. And then with her messed up relationship with her mom, you and her grandmother dying, you get this conversation of just wanting someone to care about you. And so I do think there's a conversation to be had there. Honestly, the star, I think it should be longer. So we could explore more topics, but overall a really enjoyable memoir. And this is why I appreciate something like this more than crying in H Mart, because although crying in H Mart is a really specific story like this is, this I think hits on more topics and more conversation. I feel like more conversation can be started by somebody's daughter. And crying in H Mart feels a little too specific for my taste in a memoir but I think it's honestly a matter of preference I think some people when they read a memoir want a very specific story and I can do that Will Smith's story is very specific but it's fun it has charisma there's a bop to it crying in H Mart didn't really have that I felt like I could have been reading a story about anyone and also it feels too tight for me to be re be able to relate to it. So it existed in this weird middle I couldn't get behind. But anyway, the book I'm looking forward to reading the most this entire video and I can't wait to get into. I'm about to run my ass back in bed and read is Viola Davis Finding Me. I am so excited to read this and that is the next book that we are going to read, okay? I will talk to you guys later. I have a seafood boil being delivered to my house because just because I'm sick don't mean I'm not greedy. It don't mean I'm not greedy. So that's what I'm about to eat. I will talk to you guys later. Peace. Hello, you guys. I am back real quick because I'm about to sit on my couch and watch Hitch. It's so funny because I'm about to talk to you more about some Will Smith. But I'm about to sit on my couch and watch Hitch. When I die and all of you people who love me have a Kenyathon where y'all do all the things that Kenya enjoys, make sure 
Y'all watch Hitch in my honor. Hitch is one of my favorite movies. It has been one of my favorite movies since I've seen it as a kid. We used to have like movies on demand when I grew up and like I watched it on demand. Eva Mendez and Hitch like crush just like a crush just like beauty that's what I thought a woman was Eva Mendez and Hitch I fucking love Hitch so that is what I'm gonna watch because I don't feel good and when I don't feel good I like to watch movies that make me feel good you know just something a little cozy so I'm gonna watch Hitch and we already know right now I'm in my Will Smith era speaking of Will Smith era Viola Davis finding me. The reason why I say speaking of Will Smith, Will Smith gets a cameo in Viola Davis' memoir. Viola Davis pretty much came up with the name of this book because of Will Smith. Will Smith changed your lives. I don't know what to tell you, but she talks about being on the set of Suicide Squad with Will Smith. And Will Smith was like, what's the real you, Viola Davis? And she's like, what are you talking about, Will? Like, this is the real me. He's like, no, rem I got my heart broken when I was 15 years old. And from then on, I've been kind of like that person. That person is me. Like, everything I do is for that person. Basically, a canon event. This was my canon event. This happened to me, and it shaped the rest of my life. Everything I do now is because of that event. And so she's like... What is my moment? Finding me, finding who the real me is at the Will Smith sale. Who are you? Like finding, boom. And like, I relate to that so much as someone who like everything I, I have certain moments in my life that had just really affected me. I don't think I would ever write a memoir, but because I don't know if I take myself seriously enough, but I have moments in my life where I don't know. Unfortunate things have happened to me. Nothing, nothing crazy. And maybe that's why I don't take myself too seriously. But there are just moments in my life where I just feel like things happen to me that shouldn't have happened to me or things happened to me. And I was never the same after that. And I think it's affected who I am as a person, good and bad. And so the idea of this like memoir really hits me. This is absolutely amazing. Viola Davis, the woman you are, you want to know what I love about about this memoir unlike may unlike other memoirs maybe not some in this video maybe maybe some in this video I have to think about it this feels so genuine you often have Viola Davis talking about how she doesn't remember certain moments like I don't know if this happened I don't know how this happened I don't know why and it makes this really relatable the way Viola Davis is recounting the stuff that happened to her she's not putting extra sauce on it she's not trying to make you feel something it just feels like someone's genuine story Story. And as a black woman, it just feels really good to have an older black woman talk about what she went through as a child and almost bring validation to your childhood stuff. She talks about this feeling of not being enough as a black girl. And just because you exist, there's an issue. And it's just like in somebody's daughter, this universal truth for black girls that your presence my memory card was full. I'm sorry. But your presence is a burden to everyone. But at the exact same time, people still expect you to do amazing things. And Viola Davis just summed it up well. She, she said, how do you climb a mountain with no legs? And that's really truly how it feels to be a black girl. Because everyone, it was like how I was talking about that I said, I explained really poorly with the Ashley Ford book. This idea that everyone has an issue with you, but everyone also expects you to be great. Everyone expects you to also solve that issue. They see you as less than, they see you as a problem, but also think you are the person who is supposed to solve a problem that you did not create. It almost would feel better if people completely disposed of you because there's almost this inhumane way people treat black women and black girls. It's this idea that you're invisible, but also you need to do so much work to get everyone else to a different point. They don't see you as human beings. And it's so hard because even the people who think you ain't shit expect you to be shit. And when you're not shit, they make fun of you for it, but they already thought you wasn't shit. It's weird. It's a weird, it's, um, there's this idea. I forgot who, who coined it. 
this um being in a being in an upside down room oh i'm butchering it but there's this idea this theory that black women are born in an upside down room where you walk in the room and everyone's telling you go this way go that way but the room is flipped upside down and you're not even aware that the room is flipped upside down nothing is in the right place but people expect you to know where everything is. People expect you to act a certain way, but the room is flipped upside down and you're trying to explain to people, this shit don't make sense. Like, what are you telling me to do? But no one wants to acknowledge that the room is flipped upside down. No one is telling you, hey, the odds are stacked in your favor. It's not supposed to make sense. So when you're young and you're navigating this world, nothing makes sense. Nothing, because it's just like, the world is flipped upside down and no one has told you that. So you're not supposed to wear, when we go back to the somebody's daughter book, you're not supposed to wear certain clothes because men might sexually assault you, but you don't wear the clothes and men still sexually assault you. The room is flipped upside down. You don't get it. And then when you do get sexually assaulted, people blame you for those things. And you're constantly being yelled at for being fast, promiscuous, a hoe and all these things. But the men who are doing shit to you get nothing. They get praised. They get praised. The stuff they do gets pushed under the rug. Viola Davis talks about this. She talks about how... These men who are going around molesting and harming black girls are just getting away with it. And the people who are getting, the people who are getting punishment are these black girls. It's the upside down room. And that's the perfect way to describe black womanhood and black girlhood. Constantly moving around in a world that is just upside down. People are trying to give you directions, but it's upside down. And the sick and twisted part is that people expect you to find your way out of the room. That's another, it'd be one thing if like the world is upside down and people just like, y'all lost. But people expect you to get out of the room. People expect you to overcome everything that is against you. And it's just like, how? How? And if you do overcome it, people use you as a success story. But the thing is, you don't even know everything that went into me being a success. And... I shouldn't have had to go through those things, you know? I shouldn't have had to go through those things. Like, I am not happy that I overcame the stuff that I overcame because it shouldn't have happened. It just shouldn't have happened. But people think because you did it, you made it out of the upside down room. You, you're the prize. And so people expect all black women to do that. And that's just not the case. And Viola Davis is just giving you stories that constantly confirm this identity that all black women, I believe, share. And it's just so good. Viola Davis is a brilliant writer, by the way. It's just so good. And Viola Davis is just constantly hitting on things. And I've never related to a memoir in a way like this. Like her childhood, though Viola Davis had a rough child. They had rats. I ain't never had to live with rats, child. Um, never been on welfare, you know. But I there's just this the root of this. I really appreciate and I really I really can relate to in a way I did not expect to relate this to this and this idea of Viola Davis wanting to make it out and why she would make it out and all of this stuff this is really good so anyways I'm gonna talk to you guys later because back again I'm sweating I'm sweating but I'll talk to you hello you guys I'm here to give you final thoughts on Viola Davis Finding Me. I'm going to give this book five out of five stars. This is a really excellent memoir. It's so sharp and it's so clear. It's it's not that long of a memoir and Viola Davis has so many things to say and it's crazy that she was able to do it in such little time. She gives you enough information on her past and enough information on like her success and her becoming the Viola Davis we know and love that it's brief, but it's just enough. Like you don't feel like you need to get any more and you get the little, because the whole thing about a memoir 
is leaving like breadcrumbs, like leaving breadcrumbs and kind of like weaving everything together. And I think Viola Davis is able to do that. And you're taking away the things that you need to take away. When I was talking about the Will Smith memoir, I was saying how the Will Smith memoir 100% just turned into like a look at all the great things Will Smith has done. And although I love that, it does take away from the point of a memoir. Because I go back when I was talking about crying in H Mart, you want a memoir to be relatable in in some way and I think Viola Davis and I'm happy I saved this for last because I think Viola Davis took everything that these three memoirs did well and she put it into one memoir it's just really really good and she touches on all the topics that these memoirs touch on but I just think she did it in a more clever and sharp way I'm sick so I feel like I didn't do the Viola Davis memoir justice. I was re-watching the clip and I'm like, I didn't even talk about what I really enjoyed about the Viola Davis memoir. I enjoyed how Viola Davis talked about her success. We often talk about how great Viola Davis is. She's an EGOT winner. And Viola Davis was discussing how her being so good is actually maybe not that great. It's actually a testament to how racist people were towards her. When she was at Juilliard, they constantly made her be so good at things because they didn't feel like she was enough as is. There were a bunch of white actors who just got to kind of be one trick ponies. They got to be good at just one thing. And people thought that because they were good at this one thing, they were great. But because she was black, she had to constantly, constantly prove that she was more than just black. And I thought that was really, really interesting because when you get someone who's as great as Viola Davis, you constantly get people being like, I'm the one of one, you know? I am the person who was just better than everyone else and I made it because I was better than everyone else black excellence but you hear Viola Davis almost talk about this idea of black excellence in a way that's not all that great why did Viola Davis have to be so fucking excellent like even even when she was excellent she still ran into issues like she was excellent because people were racist people m constantly pushed her not because they wanted her to be better but because they thought she wasn't enough she constantly had to prove that she was more and more and more so for example in order to get a role as a russian person in a play they constantly wanted her to constantly improve her accent, improve her accent, but the white people didn't have to improve their Russian accent. It was just because they were white. They got to be Russian. They got to play these certain roles. They got to play whimsical fun and all this stuff, and she had to constantly prove that she was whimsical. She had to prove she was fun, prove that she was flirty, but everyone else kind of got that themselves, and because she constantly had to prove herself, that is how she became so excellent, and so she talked about this idea of like being excellent as this like double edged sword it was on like being excellent is great but it would be nice if i got an option not to be it'll be it would be nice to be given the option not to be excellent and i think that's just what this book hits on this idea of black womanhood and black girlhood there's no option to not be excellent people dispose of you if you're not excellent people decide who they're going to invest in, and then they want you to be the best of that, and everyone else gets discarded. And I thought Viola Davis hit on that very well. Viola Davis also talks about being an actress, and it's really interesting to see in a book like Will, in a book like Viola Davis, in a book like Viola Davis, Will enjoys being successful. I do not think Will Smith would be an actor if there was not success aligned to it. Will Smith enjoys accomplishing things, but you get someone like, and I don't think there's any issue with that, right? Like you'd come, you do the job, you make the money. But, but Viola Davis really enjoys acting. And it's so interesting to read from someone who really enjoys acting. And another thing I find really interesting, Viola Davis went to Juilliard. I don't think any celebrity who has gone to Juilliard and made it big talks positively about Juilliard. You got the people who went to Juilliard who just act like they never fucking was there. You got the people 
people with the Juilliard and actively like dislike it and that's Vi Viola Davis. Viola Davis shits on Juilliard so much and it's so funny because the people who go off to Yale and stuff, they just talk about how much they love Yale and how much Yale taught them so fucking much. But the people who go to Juilliard hate that shit. What's going on at Juilliard, child? Viola Davis made y'all sound racist as fuck down at the Juilliard. Anyway, so this book, I wanted to get some details in about what I really, really enjoy. She talks about being successful and she wasn't that successful. What people were asking her for money and almost how she couldn't outrun her trauma. I don't know if this was intentional, but I feel like it was because like this book is so short. She was discussing the rats. She writes about almost in every step of her life, she comes in contact with rats. And I use the rats to almost, um... To almost show her trauma. The rat, the she can't escape the rat. She grew up with rats. Every apartment she goes into has rats. Every time there's rats, 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 rats. And it's almost the rats are just her trauma. She's trying to run away from it. She's trying to push through. But the rats keep places there shouldn't be rats. There end up being rats. Every time she thinks this is a better situation, there's more and more rats. And I thought that was just really, really interesting. I loved her breaking down the bids about her not being seen as the girlfriend. You want to know what? J Lo got some good PR. Viola Davis was talking about how back when J-Lo wasn't that famous and Viola Davis definitely wasn't famous. J-Lo was really nice to her. They used to drive around. They was besties for a short period of time. So good for you, J-Lo. You finally got some good press. Um, so yeah, this book just has a lot going on. Okay, now we can wrap up the video. <laughs> Something I really found interesting, the three memoirs written by black people, all three of these memoirs talk about the violence that they witnessed women or themselves go through from the hands of other men. And I really think we just, the black community, we have to have a conversation about the misogyny and the violence towards women that is so normalized in our community. The fact that all three of these stories tell a tale about a father figure in their life putting their hands on a woman, what does that say? And it's so funny because we constantly talk about, well, people talk about how black men are gonna save the black community and we need to do this to save the black community. It's always about how we uplift black men, but a conversation that needs to be had before we can talk about saving the black community is how many of, many people have stories about seeing black men harm the black women in their life or harm them. You know what I'm saying? All three of these stories, Will Smith's mom, was abused by his um, da dad. Viola Davis' mom was abused by her dad. And in this, Ashley and her mom was abused by her mom's boyfriend. And then Ashley's uh, dad sexually assaulted two women. So like, what is that? So there's a conversation that needs to be had about the violence that a lot of people witness from the hands of black men in their family. And I think oftentimes in order to try to paint this great picture of the black community and like everything's on the up and up, we're not talking about the serious violence issue that is going on. And that's just something that is the truth about a lot of black families. A lot of black families do sweep the trauma that black men inflict on the black women in their family under the rug in order to save face or in order to keep this idea that black men are going to save the black community but like this what the black men doing in the black community you know so i just think we need to have a more well rounded conversation and i think these books actually do do a good job at that because i don't think these books just turn around and turn their dads or their whatever into these like horrible villainous people they have real conversations about what they went through so overall i enjoyed reading these memoirs i really really did i'm happy i did i've put off the, off this video for literally all year i put off this video all year but i am happy i did finally get to the memoirs and that is the end of september i will see you guys in october we are going to be reading nothing but thriller mystery books all october and i will see you guys for that